we'll start with the second section of our UN breakfast today. Uh, we have uh, two speakers from Biomedical Science Department. And uh, the first speaker will be Dr. Suzita, Associate Professor Dr. Suzita. She is the current coordinator of the Zebra Fish Lab. So she did her PhD in Australia and when there was uh, when she uh, exposed to the zebra fish model. Today she will be sharing the uh, cancers um, um, research on the zebra fish larvae. I'll hand over to you, Dr. Jessica. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Dan. And um, let me just uh, get this up. Okay. And uh, thank you to Faculty of Medicine for this opportunity for this opportunity to talk at uh, this uh, well, breakfast talk. So I'll be um, talking about our zebrafish model, specifically how we use uh, the zebrafish larvae for xenografts in uh, hopes to find cures for cancer. To begin, I'll be telling you about what the zebrafish is. It's a freshwater fish of the minnow family, and it is actually native to South Asia. Uh, it, it has a very wide habitat range from uh, Pakistan in the north all the way south to Bangladesh. Zebrafish is a very common fish. You have probably seen it in an aquarium at a shopping mall or even in a in aquarium at home, but they're not native to our country. Their lifespan is only about a year in the wild, but in the lab, they can uh, get up to five years old. And uh, the average adult size is small. They're only about three to five centimeters in length. They were established as a genetic and developmental biology model in the early 1980s with work on them starting as early as the 70s. And now they're pretty much used uh, for biomedical applications at all life stages from their embryo stage to larvae to juvenile to adult. And what you're seeing here is an adult zebrafish. You can see that they have these characteristic stripes uh, running all the way down their sides. And that's where they get their name from, their little zebrafish. And uh, they develop very quickly which is part of the attraction of this model. They reach maturity at, th at, uh, sorry, at three months. And uh, when you look at how fast they develop during their very, very early life stages, you can basically track every single point of development that you might be interested in. The uh, work with zebrafish as a biomedical model really exploded in the 1990s when two teams, from one from North America and one from Europe, uh, came together to induce chemical mutations at the genetic level. And uh, they were able to produce large-scale uh, collections of genomic-induced malformations. And this gave everyone a lot of information about the kind of mutations that can occur during development that can affect vertebrates. The collection of the work that was done was published in a special issue of the Development Journal in 1996. And uh, if you happen to flip through that journal now, it's, it's an amazing piece of work uh, from, from hundreds of people who just documented every uh, point of mutation that was observed. And now uh, the zebrafish is used in probably thousands of laboratories around the world. It has significant homology with mammals, which I'll talk about some more in a bit. Their small size makes them applicable for use at every stage of life. You just need a stereo microscope if you're using embryos. And um, they are highly fecund, which means that they produce hundreds of babies every single week. And they have a short generation interval, so you can grow up those babies within three months. They're sexually mature and able to produce babies of their own. Their embryogenesis is well characterized, as I showed in the previous slide. And they're optically transparent, which means that we can watch them grow and we can watch their organs develop inside their bodies. 
because of their genetic similarity to us humans, uh, we can take advantage of the fact that they have these conserved genes and functions with us to model diseases of interest. So here's a one-on-one -on -one comparison of the anatomy of humans and fish. Now, obviously, there's going to be a lot of differences, but what we want to focus on is just how similar we are. And if you have a look at just this uh, small uh, image here of the human heart and the zebrafish heart, there's the difference in terms of just um, they only have one atrium and one uh, ventricle, but in terms of function, exactly the same. In terms of development of the heart, exactly the same. And then they do have that extra advantage that we do not have, which is that they can regenerate. Uh, so an injury to the heart means that they can regenerate the heart, and that makes them a great model for studying the heart. And in terms of genetic homology, as early as 2013, uh, the zebrafish genome was fully sequenced. And out of that, it was determined that 71% of human genes have at least one ortholog with a zebrafish. And uh, reciprocally, 69% of zebrafish genes have at least one ortholog in humans. Of those orthologous genes, 47% of human genes have this one-to-one -one relationship with a zebrafish homolog, uh, ortholog. But for those genes that don't have a direct ortholog, there's another functional gene that can be used. So for example, the BRCA1 gene, which is of course very much studied in cancer, in, in cancer research, we don't have a direct BRCA1 gene in zebrafish, but they do have an ortholog for BRCA2. So ultimately, the use of zebrafish has really caught on because of how they're an ethical alternative to mammals. Uh, we apply the principles of the three R's, placement, reduction, and refinement. They're easily available, easy to handle. There's lower cost to uh, maintaining them. And they're just readily available. And we know exactly how to use them for our studies. So in terms of research areas, uh, they're used in just practically every uh, system that you can think of. But today we're really gonna focus on how they're used in drug discovery, especially for cancer studies. What you're seeing on the left of the screen is how we use the embryos for acute toxicity screening. So if you have a new compound, you just want to know whether it's safe, uh, you can use the embryos for that first stage of screening. And uh, this image here, it's not from cancer study, but it's a nice representative of how we would use the embryos to then uh, no, basically confirm if they can be uh, treated with whatever compound that has been generated. And uh, just zooming in on cancer studies, this is a, just a scholar, a uh, Google Scholar page of the number of hits that you get. Just in 2024, zebrafish cancer gets you more than 16,000 uh, results. And to go into the specifics, um, you can actually model human cancers in the zebrafish itself. What you're seeing here on the left are zebrafish models of melanoma, a very, very uh, uh, lethal cancer very difficult to study, but by by modeling it in zebrafish, researchers were able to develop drugs to basically you know, come up with, with a form of treatment. And uh, what you're seeing on the right are um, zebrafish models that have been generated to study acute myeloid leukemia. And if you're wondering, yes, the zebrafish blood cells are pretty much the same as our blood cells, and we can basically determine just what blood cell populations are around, and we can also see overexpression of white blood cells. That's actually what you're seeing there with a little bit of a shadow, uh, which is seen in what we call the caudal hematopoietic progenitor cell area, and uh, these are the kinds of treatments that can bring down the cell count. But what I really want to focus on are xenografts. And the xenografts are basically where you have tissue transplanted from one individual 
to another uh, animal. Popularly, this is done on mute mice. Mute mice are immunocompromised, uh, so they don't have that immune system that would reject the tumor that's been engrafted. The zebrafish larva, though, is becoming a very popular alternative model because larvae at that age completely lack the adaptive immune system that might cause rejection. So essentially, we're taking cancer cells from a patient or from cell lines, labeling them with fluorescence, introducing them into the zebrafish larva, incubating the larva, and uh, we're able to observe what's happening with the cancer cells. Do they metastasize? Uh, how do they metastasize? And of course, can those cancer cells be eliminated by treatment? Specifically, we're talking about lung cancer. That's, uh, that's a study that I'm involved with, uh, with colleagues from pharmacy department, uh, fa fa pharmacy faculty, sorry, and also from the chemistry department at the Faculty of Science. Our interest is in the EGFR mutation, specifically how mu new mutations keep coming up and resisting treatment. So by developing a new compound, which is a basically coded compound 307, the idea is to assess whether the compound or well, uh, variants of the compound would work in vitro and in vivo. And if they do work, uh, the pharmacy faculty will then take over to devise a method to formulate and deliver the drug and ninolipid nino carriers. So for the biomedical science team, what we are doing is we are uh, performing embryo acute toxicity assays on the compounds that have been created. The cancer cells that we use are from uh, the cell line that harbor a particular two, two particular mutations. And uh, these mutations are resistant to current uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So we introduce the cancer cells into the larva and uh, basically watch the larva grow along with the cancer cells inside and uh, see if our uh, compound 307 variant can work against the cancer cells. We're still in preliminary stages, but what we're seeing is pretty exciting. When everything comes together and everything works, what we hope to achieve is to be able to identify that the drug does uh, uh, remove the cancer cells from the zebrafish. And this would then allow the research to progress to mam mammalian models and eventually to human clinical trials. And um, I'd like to thank the people who are very, very important to our zebrafish. Uh, Mr. Zulfikri is our carer in the lab and the vets and the staff of uh, the Animal Experimental Unit uh, provide us with all the support that we need. I also wish to thank the students, especially the students who were involved with uh, the cancer xenograph work. I just talked about Rose, VE, and Jivita. And uh, the work that I was talking about was supported by the Impact-Oriented Interdisciplinary Research Grant. Thank you. Thank you, Associate Professor Dr. Zuzita. Uh, we have some time here. Um, is there any questions for Associate Professor Dr. Zuzita? Okay, maybe I can uh, I have some questions on the zebrafish. First of all, thanks for your interesting introductions on the zebrafish and how we can work around with the uh, cancer treatments or cancer uh, studies on zebrafish. Um, if you would like to start with the uh, zebrafish um, research, is there any um, guidance from the uh, zebrafish or uh, how um, we have no experience on zebrafish, so how should we deal with it, or, 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 or how should we assess the healthiness of the zebrafish? Right. Yeah, that's that's a great th uh, question. Thanks. So with the zebrafish, 
uh, we are fortunately uh, blessed with a lot of resources. And um, even though they are very, very different from us, there's still some characteristics that make them similar enough that we can identify if an animal is in discomfort. Uh, so especially with cancer treatment, uh, the use of a, a mammalian model is often distressing to the researcher because of just what cancer tumors would do to the animal. So with uh, zebrafish, that effect is slightly reduced because after all, they, they are very, very different from us. But uh, they do respond to the types of analgesias that are used with mammals. Uh, and when they're used at very, very young life stages, the experiments are usually done very, very uh, briefly. They just take a period of a few days and then they're done. So we, we do refine experiments to reduce as much of the um, effect of our cancer as we can when we're working with larvae. For instance, um, hope uh, from now onwards, uh, there will be more researchers who ventures into the eagle world debuff study after they have uh, conducted their uh, uh, testing on the cells. Uh, okay. The time constraint, sorry, I have stopped at the Q&A section. We we'll move on to um, Associate Professor Dr. Anwar. Right. So Associate Professor Dr. Anwar is another um, uh, 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 from the biomedical science uh, department. He will be introducing um, the Parkinson's disease um, using the um, zebra fish model as well. So please welcome uh, Super Professor Dr. Uh, pass over uh, to you. All right. <clears throat> uh, Assalamualaikum. Good morning, everyone. Uh, can everyone hear me and see my screen? All right. Okay, great. All right. So um, thank you and uh, good morning, everyone, for joining um, for this quick talk today. So um, Dr. Susie has already given a, a outline of uh, the uses of zebrafish and so in cancer. So hopefully I will be talking about the uses of zebrafish for neurodegeneration. All right. So just a quick overview about Parkinson's disease. Right, so currently it affects around 1% of people age 60 and above globally. Right. In Malaysia, we are looking at about 15 to 20,000 people. This is according to the Malaysian Parkinson's Disease Association. And what is, is worrying, or because we are becoming an aging nation, is there is no definite diagnosis as well as cure. So at the moment, the only thing that we can do, or current therapy, is to increase, is, current therapy is actually just to increase quality of life. So it's not uh, curative, but it's more just to help with the symptoms that happen. And another big thing about Parkinson's disease is that 95% of the cases are sporadic. Right? So we are still trying to understand what causes Parkinson's disease and, and, and so forth. So because of the nature of the disease, it's something that you do not catch early on. It's usually caught once you start showing symptoms. And interestingly, about 5% of uh, Parkinson's disease actually show genetic association. So the main players when, uh, when you talk about Parkinson's disease is like Parkin, Pink1, DG1, and LAC2. So I think just to add on to what um, Dr. Sun Hao actually just uh, um, talked about earlier about hoping people move to zebrafish work. So this is a quick slide. We're looking at the UK. So fish are actually the number two animals used when you're looking at biomedical research the first being mice and it's actually even more in rats right and then if you're looking at um then of course you have people using birds and others as well so with um with the three r's that we are looking at that we all should be looking into right so we we, we should actually start looking at all different types of animal models so, um, Dr. Susie did talk a bit about um, zebrafish and with cancer and, you know, the homologies and whatnot. So now I just want to talk about more about the brain, right? So if you can see here, there are two pictures. At the top is the zebrafish brain 
and at the bottom is the human brain. And the zebrafish, even though it may look different, has the same areas that you will find in the human brain. So you do have your olfactory bulb, you do have your telencephalon, right? You do have your diencephalon, right? And you have your cerebellum and spinal cord and so forth. So each part of this brain correlates as well with certain populations of neurons and, and what they are used for. So if you are even looking at regulatory circuitry, all right, the zebrafish brain as well, which is at the, at the below here, has the same circuitry that you'll find in the human brain as well. So you're looking at your noradrenaline, serotonin, dopamine, and so forth. So for us, of course, being working, working with zebrafish, all right, uh, and working with Parkinson's disease, dopamine, of course, is the main, main player that we are looking at. All right, so we are looking at the fish version of substantia nigra. We are looking at the fish version of the uh, nigrostriatal pathway. So if you can see here, which are very nice pictures um, that was published in the Frontiers of Neuroanatomy, where you can actually look at as well, you, know, you can track the projections of the diencephalonal spinal dopaminergic system in zebrafish larvae as well. All right. So my interest in, in Parkinson's started when I was doing my PhD many years ago. And uh, I was fortunate to, to, to work together with uh, Dr. Susie, who we were wondering, like, okay, look, what's, what do we, when we first come back as a young lecturer, how much money do we have? And we said, we can actually start with the zebrafish. So I then um, converted from uh, a rodent model to doing a lot of zebrafish models. All right. And um, one thing which is we are looking at now is actually more to do with understanding um, the model itself, right? Because our research is only as good as our model. So we are really trying to develop the animal model and really try to understand it, right? So then we can use that model for other experimental work. So the beauty about zebrafish is the type of scientific techniques that we can use. So um, Dr. Susie has mentioned about using larvae, but we also use adults as well. So depending, so, but my presentation is mainly on um, the larvae itself. So the, the beauty of these zebrafish larvae is that there's a lot of scientific techniques you can use with it. So because they are, they are, we can actually keep them to be transparent. All right, you can actually do whole mount uh, immunofluorescence. So you can look and we have your transgenic animals or your zebrafish fish. You can start labeling, you know, certain uh, neuron, neuronal populations. You can look at uh, calcium channel, uh, calcium activity. We can do whole mount in situ hybridization. And because we now know the genome of the zebrafish, we can actually start using CRISPR, Cas9, Morpholinos, all right, to actually even alter the genetics uh, of, the, of the larvae. And then we also now know that there's, there's a neurotoxins as well that we can use. All right, to induce certain diseases. And of course, you have your PCR, so all your molecular work that can be done using it. And zebrafish larvae as well have their own behavior, so which I'll talk about later. All right, so using looking at their behavior will also help to look at or understand the disease progression or treatment and so forth. So currently, right, there is no in vitro in vivo model that can fully recapitulate PD symptoms and pathology. All right, so we have to take that in mind that no model is perfect. So we have to look at what is our research question and does the model that we want to use, is the model that we want to use able to answer this? All right, so at the moment, um, current PD experimental models include toxins, all right, where we give toxins. We have genetic models as well as some actually do in combination as well. All right, so my work is mainly looking at neurotoxins all right so the one main neurotoxin that people use that you probably hear about is mptp all right so mptp is actually discovered as a byproduct for a bad batch of heroin so if you look at the the i mean the earlier papers is that there was uh we had all these people who had taken this bad batch and came in with parkinson like symptoms all right um and when they discovered what was the, 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 the factor that caused it was actually MPTP. All right, so MPTP is known to um, attack dopaminergic neurons. All right, so it's metabolized to MPP+. It empowers the dopaminergic neurons, uh, 
via the dopaminergic transporter, inhibits the mitochondrial complex one, thus disrupts the mitochondrial respiratory chain, and then causes death to dopaminergic neurons. So one of my um, final year project students actually first start, when we first started off was we'll start looking at is there a difference between giving um, MPTP or exposing the larvae to MP MPTP very early on, and so 24 hours post fertilization, or we're we looking at four days post fertilization. So it's important to note here that in zebrafish larvae, their dopaminergic um, system and, and the neurons are fully developed at four DPF or four days post fertilization. That's why we can use larvae for our, our work. So there are two two ways of looking at it. Do we give it MPTP to try and stop the development of the dopaminergic neurons? Or do we give it at four DPF or four days post fertilization when there really is a the the, the, the dopaminergic neurons are already there and then try to cause them to degenerate. So what we showed was in our lab is that um, at four DPF there was actually a decrease in the number of dopaminergic neurons in the in the brain of zebrafish larvae when, when they were exposed to MPTP. All right. So on the left is actually pictures of whole mount immunofluorescence. All right, so we took the whole larvae, did uh, immunofluorescence, and using a confocal microscope, we were actually able to look at the, the certain areas. So you had certain clusters of dopaminergic neurons in uh, in the in the brain, and actually manually count them. All right. Um, another toxin that we we use a lot is what we call is a toxin called rotenone. All right. So rotenone is actually a root extract and is used as an insecticide and a pesticide. So my, my late supervisor was actually, um, he was saying that he used to actually swim in, in lakes using rotenone to, to, to poison the fish. All right, so um, he, uh, fortunately, he, he never had any PD-like symptoms. Um, but it's something that is actually really used. So if you look at the literature, there is a lot of correlation as well now with Parkinson's disease and pesticides. All right. So rotenone is also a high affinity inhibitor of complex one. All right. Um, and it's important to note that rotenone is the only neurotoxin that can actually induce um, alpha synuclein. Right? So alpha synuclein is the proteins which is part of Lewy bodies. So if you're looking at other neurotoxins, they do not, it does not cause these eiffel synuclein aggregation, right? So that's why I was very interested in looking at rotenone because I feel it, it really represents um, the PD model itself or the, to try and induce PD into uh, these uh, zebrafish larvae. So, um, so this work was done by um, Dr. Agnes. So uh, she was, at that time, she was my final year project. She's actually now, she got her PhD from Japan and she's actually, in Sweden now doing her postdoc. So she again looked at rotenone, all right, um, and looked at it at where you can actually do the cell counts here, all right, and so there was a difference once you give rotenone, and also looked at the uh, real-time PCR looking at the products that is associated with PD. So as uh, Dr. Susie again mentioned about um, the orthologs and whatnot, so zebrafish does not have alpha synuclein. Right? But they do have beta synuclein, synuclein gamma uh, A, and also synuclein gamma B. Okay, so she also did a, had a look at it and looked at um, all this, um, the expression levels and whatnot. Right? And then when I talked about behavior as well, all right, so these fish actually show different behavior when they are given with rotor. So we can actually track their swimming. All right, you can actually look at the swimming patterns actually change over exposure time. So this from one day post exposure to four days post exposure. All right. And also they look at their distance travel, the velocity and so forth. So this work is actually being done by my current uh, master student, uh, Zing Hen. All right. So with this and understanding of this model, the next step is using this model for looking at testing for uh, potential therapeutics. All right, um, Zinghen actually is actually looking at the brain gut axis because we, as we all know, there's a lot of work now being done on um, that, that, that links the gut with, with the brain and so forth. So um, with that, um, I'd like to thank everyone and uh, happy fishing. So back to you, Sun Hao. Thank you, Professor Dr. Anwar.
um, it's approaching nine. So, um, anyone have any questions? No. So, um, thanks again for the interesting talk on the Parkinson's using the uh, zebrafish model. Um, so I'll not further delay. If any anyone have any questions, I think uh, both of them will happy to get your uh, inquiry from the email. Right. Um. So for now, I will just end the sessions today. Thanks, everyone.